Welcome everyone to another live stream here in our operating system series. You have seen between all our stuff with FPGAs and SGMP3, I always said I'm also 20 years Linux veteran here, Linux distribution. Not the greatest fan of that anymore, more looking to a microkernel future for stability, maintainability and stuff. And just with the IT news on the other more random live channel with security usually security vulnerabilities, IT news and other bugs and features on the mom live channel there and let me check uh, that top probably uh, of the screen or somewhere in the more channel stuff if you're following that. And we had the OpenBSD, OpenSMTP, uh, remote code execution security vulnerability and recurring theme that even the best reviewed and um, the, the biggest and greatest talent and um, and such of the community and security inspired programming there of OpenBSD project fame sometimes make mistakes. And I said this before, in my opinion, after so many years, 20 years dealing with science, such kind of stuff, certainly we should not write security or IT systems in C anymore or any other insecure by design, I would say languages, even including certainly C++ or assembler or fun stuff like that. And with that, I have a couple of topics. I have among the IT news, I have another list of probably eventually wanted to discuss this. Some of them were really a little bit dated now after a couple of months. It's, it's a problem of if you collect some topics and um, yeah, you have quite many. And here are just this day. So this is brand new, just from the Fostum here. The Graveyard's worst, probably the they mean us here, the Graveyard's worst nightmare how Kubernetes and containers are redefining the Linux OS. And if I read here stuff like this, this is exactly reminding me why I um, ringing so many bells in like this is maybe not the most right. So uh, he's doing Linux even four or five years longer, longer than me. Apparently uh, a Red Hat famous Daniel Rieck. And so yeah, he works for Red Hat and so on. And so application platform, um, abstract representation of modern software stack, uh, infrastructure view, GNU Linux application view. And he in, meanwhile growing software stack complexity of uh, also, by the way, CPAN, yeah, I mean, not so many preference here, right? But also, yeah, stuff is creating larger repositories also certainly here and PM Node.js and stuff maybe getting a little bit out of control, we had this in other news. But so the historic rule of GNU Linux is here mainframe Unix. GNU Linux here of um, providing here, of course, this diverse ecosystem. And so they write here the early GNU stack management. Of course, here's some, I'm only scrolling it through to give you an overview. So there's been RPM up to date, uh, dpackage up and stuff and T2 and other distributions. So uh, efficiency through central control which of course in some way is also limiting. They have of course mass deployment and recipes, uh, efficiency through automation, binary distribution at scale, and um, late binding dependency resolution, conflict, complexity auto, made the stack composition of machines, um, still in dependency hell, and components move across dev test opt independently. Of course the central control is also limiting because you just have Red Hat Fedora also that's not like one app store for all Linux systems, certainly. But he speculates here now is at enterprise virtualization that um, this is multi-tier application consistent, consists of multiple services, heavyweight compared to running multiple processes in a single instance, efficient cluster management and so on. And so they speculate here about shifting paradigm, paradigms um, business value driven development, gaining also yeah, business value driven developers like you know, whatever. Um, so they are saying here the modern cloud is a rational prodigm of maximizes time to value, uh, elasticity, developer velocity through service abstraction and encapsulation of operational excellence, like yeah, excellence. We've seen this on the more IT channel. So they write here, so cloud uh, changed how people see software. Uh, earlier it was access enterprise uh, hardware and software is exclusive, then free software democratize the access, commercial offerings, Red Hat. Um, also, it's of course, 
I mean, free software democratized this access and then commercial offerings like, yeah, co commercial offerings and now especially as it belongs to IBM is of course exactly those. IBM solutions is expensive, mainframe, large scale that was um, hardware and software is exclusive to be replaced with open source and now it's the circle is complete of Red Hat to IBM. But 2020, the cloud operates your infrastructure, the cloud operates like by itself, your infrastructure and services. And so the cost of cloud, um, something lock in with black boxes um, and uh, lifecycle dependency. So they write here, was this even so long? Open alternative, service obstruction, also, yeah, AI stack complexity. Um, so Red, Red Hat AI, here you have it colorful AI internal, Red Hat internal AI example of container host, um, container orchestration management, unified storage, Red Hat Ceph, and streaming, Kafka application lifecycle, OpenShift, um, and just any um, layers of APIs of serverless containers, languages, um, DevOps workflow, application lifecycle, so code and data, OpenShift, unified storage, and so on. So traditional distribution versus app centricity. So um, modern software stack has become too complex to be mapped into a common monolithic namespace. And um, the tighter the stack, the bigger the issue. Repackaging frozen binary distribution offers little value to app developers. You also frozen binary distribution, right? Um, all the fun stuff. So liberation with containers, expanding use of containers from vServer over LXC and uh, to others. And so enter the container. Of course, it's just a run through to give you an overview. And then, so Kubernetes, the cluster is a computer. Kubernetes manages containerized services across cluster of Linux nodes, application defined model, whole stack, uh, artifacts move across, dev test ops unmodified, uh, whatsoever. Um, somewhat, uh, somewhat marketing slides here. So basically just one, one big marketing slide. But so they write here the new app centric platform of containers here, Kubernetes, e.g., Red Hat, OpenShift. And so they write here as in their conclusion, Linux historic role was to break vertical integration and provide common platform for an open ecosystem. The cloud has changed IT, driven efficiency across elasticity, developer velocity. I mean, what is even de developer velocity? I mean, can they, by the way, not write sentences that make sense? But the downside of cloud is concentration, vertical integration, and lock-in containers. So they, by, by the way, so they, they write here, um, yeah, that is probably how this, the end result looks then. And so they write your conclusion. Um, this is the change of the, um, how Kubernetes and containers are redefining the Linux OS with all those 20 layers of um, orchestration and Kubernetes. So this is one side. And then look how different the other side can be. And so someone else just writes here, the kind of same day, nearly here monolith, monoliths are the future. And uh, just, of course, the entire opposite, right? So someone says Kubernetes orchestration um, containers to manage all your software lifecycle and deployment and stuff. And stuff is getting too complex. We need just what we had in another IT news or something. This it's a serverless email server with 30 or 40 microservices. And here, the exact opposite of one is saying, so this is redefining the open source and Linux um, uh, landscape and the gray beards versus nightmare, like old men yelling at cloud. And then the exact, exact opposite of monolithics, monoliths are the future because the problem people are trying to solve with microservices doesn't really line up with reality. Like the previous, um, where was it even, um, this serverless email, can't even make this up. Um, GitHub or something I should have actually. Um, mail in a box helps. Um, was it this? No. Anyway, 
Need to check probably should have email notification for featured mail server using Docker. Probably not this. Anyway, someone made there some simple stuff with 3040. It was not this, I think it was something else. Anyway, so doesn't line up with reality and just to be honest, uh, they've done it before, gone from microservices to Monolithic and back again, both directions. And um, so now it's a nightmare. We just started creating classes. This person went through the gang of four book, came back and started doing design patterns and then quit. So half the code base is doing like this with uh, whatever. And creating 50 deployables, but it's really a distributed monolith. It's actually the same thing. Um, so he's saying like microservices, um, now when you went from writing bad code to building bad infrastructure, it's like, yeah, re recurring theme here, right? Um, then you deploy the bad code on top. And this is of course exactly so, this is exactly, so in my opinion, it can certainly not be both sides that we get like a totally microservice container uh, structure. The problem of course, this is, this is Kubernetes and containers, of course, that usually people bundle like totally outdated dependencies. And then when they say use containers to, for, to deploy, you usually have um, a lot of outdated dependencies and like it solves all the problems of dependencies and, and whatnot and frozen binary distributions. When in reality, it's, it's not fixing it. It's not solving it. It's just like moving it. So you outdated stuff like lives forever. And you don't even, most people don't review this, like with the voting apps there just gone wrong and other stuff. So you just drag in containers with outdated stuff. And the, the problem is usually you had like an up-to-date operating system with up-to-date libraries. And now you have all those 40 or so containers, which each of them having something that's not even often or at all updated. And with all these problems bit rotting away there. But it can also not be that we have only Monoliths here, like having what they mean by this, it's like here uh, bringing Kubernetes as so we can do microservices. We are going to re-architect everything. But um, so if you don't have to add that to the monolith, you can create a new application that handles most of the mobile concerns and then connect back to existing infrastructure. Um, so somehow they of which, by the way, this is maybe not the best summary, probably I should have, oh, here's something longer, this, whatever. So certainly we cannot have it both ways. It can certainly not be, uh, uh, oh my God, this is long. Um, so mon monoliths are certainly, Kubernetes infrastructure deployments are certainly not monoliths. And it it's, can certainly not be that Kubernetes massive cloud orchestration as well as monoliths are the future, except if we have half and half, like somewhat deployment of Kubernetes and some deployment of monoliths. However, I would even say, so some people I've seen are doing crazy stuff, stuff like um, running Hool web servers without an OS in virtual machine instances, like running them um, in dev, in ring null or something. I mean, basically this is really also funny um, that you lose all the comfort of the management of an operating system with uh, processes and stuff when you run web servers or databases OS-less in just some virtualized uh, guest instance of QEMU KVM. But you see the pro prob problems in the IT landscape are so diverse and complex that people they, they grasp any straw they can find being it putting orchestrating everything in, uh, in, a, in a huge mountain of Kubernetes or turning to monoliths. And uh, this is somewhat reflecting my struggle of uh, wanting more, um, uh, more fine-grained control of an operating system in terms of microkernel that um, I currently see this is monolith that is a Linux kernel. And in some ways, maybe I shortly take a look at the comments that we have already quite some. So what on earth is a monolith? Never heard of the name before. So monolith, um, for example, uh, so monolith is when you, instead of like one big application, like um, even web servers, which I already mentioned, I should have Google what was this. There was some web server 
maybe even was it in Rust and written uh, running in um, some guest VM like what would this have been building a multi-thread web server? Um, this is basically um, yeah stuff like this or database or similar stuff like that and um, Use control K. What do you want to press with control K is uh, probably. Oh, you probably mean like kill and love line. Um, so, welcome everyone. Unikernel. Um, yeah, let's. Uh, what do we get with Unikernel? Um, uh, let's see. What does it say here? It's a special single machine image constructed using library operating system. Yeah, this is exactly what I meant. A library operating system such as people running a web server. Like, um, do we have an example? If we Google Unikernel web server, maybe even KVM, or um, here is Unikernel running a Rambron Unikernel. Yeah, stuff like this. But I really wonder. If this is any benefit, right? You take all the profile, like all the comfort of an operating system, like a debugger. Certainly, you can debug it, but then you debug it like an operating system, like no easy profiling, no easy debugging. Well, you can debug and you can profile, but it's like you de develop an operating system. So, with all the surrounding, well, basically operating system, right? And um, certainly, I understand that. Um, so comments in the audience told briefly about containers and Kubernetes. What's those things in a nutshell? So in a, in a nutshell, um, Kubernetes and containers. So containers is when you, which by the way, are we a couple of drop frames? No, my chat preview. So in a nutshell, container is simply a kind of virtual machine that you install if you that you don't run your web server. In, in your operating system, but in containers. So you put like your email server in a container. Container do not necessarily need to be in whole operating system. Even decades ago, there were virtual Linux virtual server like we said some, something uh, user mode Linux and um, other containers. But nowadays people run this also OS less in Xen or KVM and um, things like that. And um, Kubernetes, as then usually Kubernetes is just a huge collection, so that you don't you have like each service in a virtual machine image, so that you have a huge network out of connected instances like database, maybe even multiple database cluster, and all the microservices like one microservice for your payment processing, another um, Kubernetes for or container for your. Um, Front end multiplexer or cache mechanism or fallback uh, load balancing and so on. So that is um, the uh, the summary. Um, Marco writes, nevertheless, the assumption is going full exokernel, going full exokernel in the future. ABIs as a collection of libraries implementing protocols on a client platform specific way, enhanced portable code, foster microkernel, so more foster micro. Kernel Dev Room had some pretty talks this year. I was surprised by the number of talks about Gnode. That's interesting and uh, good to know and inspiring. Maybe I should go more often to Fostum, but um, to lead the line, sort of go to, yeah. Um, again, then I guessed that wrong. I uh, guessed it right. The, um, it sounds, of course, in some way, it sounds, of course, a little bit. Um, why I want to go more microkernel, but I mean, one if you compare this, as this is of course funny, uh, theoretically you can compare this situation to uh, Kubernetes and monoliths here in this deployment strategy to kernel, right? So in a way, this uh, Kubernetes compares to microkernel as in multiple server processes. Uh, even on different virtual machines, handling certain tasks. And this monolith basically being the Linux version of having everything in one single address space, just like the Linux kernel, which I personally, although I run it, don't even prefer for development, maintainability, and security, and all those many reasons. And um, in a way, if we, if we interpolate from this, then the future might even be more monoliths. Of course, the issue is, um, and this is also what 
the Linux kernel people say, they always say performance, performance, performance. I mean, certainly with all the communication and virtualization stuff, you lose performance, right? This is inevitable. And um, if it's, of course, um, ironic that just those Red Hat people of Linux now argue here for Kubernetes and containers, when that is exactly in the kernel what they did not want it there. And in a way, of course, you could implement many microservices as, or even virtualization as microkernel. And of course, this is, many people don't know how Xen started. Xen started as a para-virtualized solution, meaning without hardware virtualization support, so that you could only run specialized ported and modified and ported to this Xen para-virtualization uh, API in the beginning until they also supported like Intel hardware virtualization for full virtualization, not just para virtualization. And if we interpolate from this, then we take, okay, as the Linux monolithic kernel is so successful, then this monolithic stuff will be successful. Um, it could be. And the reason for this is certainly why is Linux so successful? Well, certainly open source and no cost and all the bells and whistles, unlike BSDs, which usually didn't have as many whistles there. But the other thing is, of course, compared to microkernels, the reason is that and the argument of Linus Torvalds and others there, of his friends and family always, like this one monolithic address based stuff, we can just make everything perfect. And of course, this argument falls short when we just open the kernel changes here. And each time we, or also dot two, right? <laughs> I did not even see this. I mean, theoretically, we can just here fire up our, um, oops, our shell and update. So this is uh, the, the future in. 2020 when each and every other day you have a Linux kernel update and so I did not even see that so update Linux uh, 552 and when we take a look at this and usually we have here lots of reverts uh, so today not some out of bounds so fix uh, I can't even make this up right I don't even need to prepare for this I open Linux kernel.org I have not even seen that there is a new 5.5 point two um, patch level security and stability fix update and I just need okay to be fair they have only one that is marked here but it is mm it's, so it's mem policy right it's not like some garbage rgb lighting or joystick or mouse or uh, other telephony stuff that nobody's using it's um, memory management subsystem right what they're trying to do is change the what what we are trying to do is change the uh, equal character to the null terminator and then function restored back to the problem there and two error process jump to the end. What the freaking heck are they even doing there? This sounds totally bizarre. I uh, can't make this up uh, for such commit messages. I'm not prepared to read live on YouTube. Um, but uh, yeah, one uh, out of bounds in mempool here of mempolicy, what, how critical that is, I don't know. Um, but um, yeah, um, the, the way of uh, perfection you see here um, that every other day we need no uh, patch level revision here because one address space and each joystick and RGB lighting driver or IPv6 and whatever can kill your whole operating system because it is 2020. And so the perfection, 30 years of Linux kernel development and we are at a state where um, we still on a, on a weekly basis or daily basis have out of bounds um, revert because they didn't test or think something through and um, other crashes, oopses, null pointer dereferences, uh, error passes, also you have a C++ exception throwing maybe they would have more um, or whatever. Um, so yeah, um, but so so much to the monolithic kernel, we can do everything perfect. And here we are 30 years later, this is how perfect this is. And of course, just the argument of maintaining everything, like millions of lines of code, which we could quickly fact check here, Linux kernel, million lines of code. What do we have here in 27.8? Apparently, according to the next best website, didn't really reasonably check this. But I mean, also, System D can't even make this up. System D uh, already, uh, how many percent are this? This is uh, 
4% or so. This is a Hauken system D be 1.3 million lines of code, I have no idea. Um, so yeah, 27.8 million lines of code in one address space, of course not all loaded at a time. There's also MIPS and ARM and RISC-V and x86 and PowerPC architecture code and stuff that you never use together like RGB lighting and joysticks and uh, outdated video for Linux capture stuff and sure very few people use this. However, we had also just two years ago some security vulnerability in QEMU or so and the floppy emulation so much to nobody is using it yet. The floppy emulation of QEMU was enabled by default in like virtually all server infrastructure deployments even at Amazon or wherever and um, then we have here some remote code execution through the floppy emulation of QEMU in, in 2018 or whenever that was. So yeah 27 was nearly approaching 30 million lines of code in one Source tree is certainly not the most easy thing to get stable and from that point of view I would argue that most of the drivers like human interface device like touchpad like all the stuff that is not DMA that is just like writing some data to some registers on some serial or parallel protocol do not belong in one single address space monolith and um, you would probably argue with each and every other application that is that large that it's not a good idea to write this as a monolith in one 27 million lines of code project. And that is of course the difference when the open source people make fun out of commercial projects like haha the Boeing failed the um, F-15-17 whatever I don't know something or the voting app uh, although this was only a shabby two month project allegedly there on the more live channel IT news. But yeah um, the problem is also somehow that, in my opinion, very few people really think this through. So everything just throws everything uh, together and sees what sticks at the wall. And that is also, my, in my opinion, from what I've seen in 20 years, that why we have such strange software architectures, because um, it's often just the result of trial and error and what see what sticks. And then we have such, uh, yeah, growing complexity, uh, outdated modules and um, uh, people trying to solve issues with putting everything in container in the hope that helps somehow or makes it maybe a little bit more secure or more manageable because 27 million lines of codes and um, yeah, in, to summarize, probably, well, certainly both cannot be true and probably as usual the, the the, the real future will be somewhere in between, meaning most likely some monoliths and some uh, cloud infrastructure things. And in a way, of course, this container stuff is not too bad of an idea. I would, however, argue that probably most setups and installation are ruined by the fact of packaging too much up and there and vintage unmaintained bit rotten code so that Although in principle, not too bad of an idea, packaging old insecure stuff is still old insecure stuff. Um, so probably um, writing, certainly stop writing stuff in C because off by one, uh, off by more and um, use after free and um, freeing an error pass, resource management and manual stuff and all this all this surrounding stuff and um, and then on top of this like architecture new more reasonable and secure stuff and not always use deploy the oldest stuff you can find somewhere in the hope it still works a little bit like open SMTBD or something. Um, so let's see we have quite some more comments uh, let's quickly check what's new there front so told so we had this foster microkernel, so yeah. Um, and also here on this channel we will soon continue, so we will soon have most likely, uh, I got some good FPGA news today, we also some more, much more, even bigger FPGA stuff coming. Um, and then also microkernel and P3 and Octane and stuff, RISC-V certainly and more microkernel. And um, let's see, the main reason for this exokernel architecture is the possibility possibility to cluster heterogeneous devices, basically private clustered 
server cloud architecture every day and Linux. So um, Striker node so strong. how do you even pronounce it? Every day Linux gets away from Linux philosophy in one way or another. And uh, other comments, twisted clowns, more on topic the Nover micro hypervisor attempts to reduce the overhead. Um, was this L4 based? Once I maybe this was L4 based. Systemd is another problem. Discovered that it couldn't use anymore. RC something got to use Systemd. Got met. Yeah, this is why in T2 I'm not even sure if we package Systemd. Certainly, personally not so. Because in my opinion, also many of the things are I mean, stuff was working. I mean, for initially it was a little bit over boot delay. Um, like faster boots and stuff, and then somehow everything got out of, out of, out of control. I have the feeling we might not have even package this because no, no one, whatever. Definitely need another way of scaling Cores x86 strong memory module. What? Um, um, multiple kernels, one per core. F BSD literally running system and per client. So yeah, barrel core. I also so I for years I followed many of the stuff already. I um, I probably didn't try Barrelfish, but I read the con concept there of Microsoft and um, University Zurich there, so research, um, ETH or something. And um, so, yeah, bar Barrelfish running multiple kernels, one per core. And you could even, I think, even on mixed systems of AMD and x86, for example, definitely need another way of scaling cores x86 strong memory mod module. And um, yeah, welcome, Carlos. 27 million lines of code, bigger code than already right alone if just 3,000. What? And the bigger code, the different written alone. If... Okay, Carlos has written 3,000 lines of code. Um, 7.3 megabyte of glibc. What do you mean? You mean the binary? Certainly the source was larger. Oh, I think the glibc source was certainly larger. Um, not boot, but lib. Let's see. So no, this is not uh, why you were saying. So the source probably we can look actually. I think I downloaded this recently as in glib. C or is this H? Oh, this is 19 megabyte. You seven seven point three. Maybe you mind me. You probably mean some pre-compiled binary stuff. Also mine is smaller. Also maybe you count. Uh, maybe you count libm and uh, lso or the whole package. But um, more comments. Wonder if somebody will ever make a kernel or an OS that will build Musil portable um, that is not GCC. So at least we have done this with Clang, with Ceiling. However, it was well, LLVM Ceiling, of course, also super large, right? The problem probably you can probably not compile Musil with um, certainly not with TCC. With PCC, I don't know, but the problem is often that they use more GNUisms and then the PCC, TCC do not compile this fancy code. And um, my glibc SO is smaller, though, as you can see. Um, that is, oh, wait a second, 19? Did I say smaller? What? Uh, wait a second. Oh, wait, this is a compressed source. What are you talking about? So mine is here 1.4, apparently. Yeah. Um, although maybe you have some of these debug symbols or whatever. Also package. Um, so strong memory module guarantees. Yeah, I, I know I know what you I know what I, what you meant. I probably didn't discuss it too much, but um, make scaling multi-thread code super hard. Although on the other hand, it, it makes a writing um, writing atomic stuff uh, super easy. If you compare this to, I've recently seen some atomic sequences for PowerPC in Boost also somewhere. Um, PowerPC Boost or Atomic Assembly that was super long. Um, code from Hilton using PowerPC Atomic. Um, anyway, so yeah, but I know what you mean. And um, um, yeah, in general, certainly x86 is, is way too complicated to, uh, to scale uh, in the future, which is probably why most likely we will. Um, risk 5 I see in certainly not the next years, but 
probably in the longer future of 10, 20 years, then probably Risk Five. My 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 estimation and expectation is that Risk Five will totally dominate this. X86 is just way too complex with a variable length complex instruction set. Um, decoding is killing us, and all the variations, including this godforsaken real mode stuff and um, all the um, other compatibility stuff. So Risk Five certainly in 10 or 20 years uh, probably be just the next years we will probably see the first Risk Five high performance silicon, and then certainly in 10 10 years I guess quite wide deployment and maybe in 20 years mm, potentially. If I would be AMD, um, I would for sure already focus on Risk Five silicon for uh, in five and 10 years. I slightly wonder AMD had ARM. I slightly wonder what uh, became out of that. I think this is AMD ARM. I, I think it was close to um, a release, um, but... Um, or do they have this? Is this Optum A series? Um, enterprise class uh, is partnering with ARM to develop a broader ecosystem. ARM64, yeah, I mean, they had this, um, not even sure if they did deploy this. I thought they delayed and canceled this, so no, they have here Threadripper. Anyway, but um, yeah, certainly, in in my opinion, as many IT vulnerabilities and insecurities we have, we certainly urgently need to do something if we will build infrastructure like this and bridges would collapse. Oh, they do. Uh, okay, uh, if we build... Uh, skyscrapers like this, they would collapse or oh, they also collapse. But um, in any case, the state of IT architecture, in my opinion, probably less amazing than um, even other real-world infrastructure. The problem is, of course, at least a bridge and a railroad and, and highway you see and normal people see. The problem with this rotting and not very secure and totally clobbered together IT infrastructure that normal people and even most IT people don't see it, especially if it's hidden in microservices and Kubernetes. And uh, this is why it is so hard to evaluate it and um, even see it and normal people to have understanding or managers and, and product managers and whatnot and CEOs and stuff. And uh, certainly there needs to be something done, um, which is, uh, yeah. Final few projects using Spark, other programming, which what would you use? You know, just building a kernel. Yeah, I read this. Um, so I probably, um, as an outlook, <clears throat> of course, the new hot stuff is Rust. And um, Rust is not too bad. The only, uh, I have two problems with, with Rust. Um, and <clears throat> the, the, the ideas and stuff of Rust are, of course, good and, and applaudable. The problem is just, I have a huge problem with their infrastructure, with this cargo, and also bootstrapping the compiler. Um, bootstrapping it is a pain, and the Rust, in my opinion, I would, I would like, like and accept Rust 10 times, like, or 100 times a magnitude more, if it would not be with this forced cargo infrastructure, because that totally doesn't play nice. I made already many videos, and if I, as a distribution, Builder and maintainer have, have it even hard to use it in some reproducible way for integration with my build infrastructure, then you already lost me and spent really multiple days on this Rust stuff. And also, I didn't find the language the nicest. I've already planned to make um, an, a video. We already made a video here of some RGB lighting on some ASUS motherboard here. And um, the problem is that, um, just let's click on something random. Um, the name's already annoying. Uh, this already sounds like super boring stuff. Uh, it's a problem when you click on something. Okay. Um, what was this? Firefox, Rust, uh, Source, and um, that was. <clears throat> Just open as ever was the name of this. And the problem is that I don't find this code very readable. And when I, th I think readability is the biggest issue for writing good and 
writing good and maintaining and reviewing code and if this uh, code is already in my opinion I don't know this is so strange verbose and I have, I have for me it really doesn't click for me and I can I can really adapt fast to stuff and don't usually need to read stuff for weeks and months but I don't know this is so strange to read um, or it or it's the way they okay it looks like so I mean they also f just formatted here really strange I I don't know I mean this is of course the referencing itself and then dot shape cache and borrow probably borrow mutable or entry uh, or insert with I, I don't know this is I have real problems parsing this. Um, maybe it's learning curve, but somehow this really looks so alien that I really wish they, in in a way it is, but leave in the comments below, certainly this triggers Rust fans, which is okay. Leave it in the comments below what you think and why you think this is amazing. I just wish C++ would have been for a decade already more memory safe, a more memory safe like Rust development. In, it's a pity that C++ lost, lost it with a decade not much ha happening and earlier being so close to C. Also, to their uh, credit, it was in the 90s for the most part. If you just think 1998, just 20 years ago, was GCC 295. Um, I remember very well because I so, sort of grew up with that and then to the time of very even GCC development it was not the ma most amazing there was some P some Pentium optimized GCC and there were EGCS of more code sorcery or something more amazing GCC fork that later reunited and then maybe even the STL was donated to free open source by SGI I think this was the SGI STL and so this was just 1998 or just 20, yeah, uh, 22 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, and at that time we had 200 megahertz or plus minus or a little bit 500 eventually. So it was a different performance range. And this is of course a difference whether you target 200, 300, 400 megahertz system. And then you need to think that this language is already many years in development. So it's not like it, they were even started on 40 megahertz or whatever spark station and stuff so certainly the performance cpu memory target back in the day totally different i just wished i mean we, we certainly lost a decade or two for most people not even switching to c++ but sticking with c where you had totally no safeguards and abstraction well ne except macro preprocessor but um yeah certainly quite some time was lost there and I wish this would be just some more readable, I don't know. I mean, we certainly had CH, CH and stuff, um, .NET and Java, which certainly are uh, topics for just dedicated hours of live stream. Anyway, that's it mostly for today. Let's see what we have in the comments and then we call this a day. I mostly wanted to share the thoughts in regards to Red Hat people, um, Monolithic versus Kubernetes and whether they really are the future well certainly the future is not probably as it is fair to say the future is not packaging old bit rotten and insecure code with outdated and even so bit rotting libraries and dependencies in kubernetes that certainly doesn't fix your security much um so then carlos writes in brazil community community if some people don't like systemd because think it's not kiss here yeah, i mean this is not in brazil uh, welcome to the rest of the world in the in the whole world there are many people who don't like systemd including myself and certainly some in the audience here and uh, hardware side things mean incredibly taxing on implement primary reason why intel can't scale course currently um few people using spark ada programming so yeah ada certainly a uh, super old thing that exists already f even longer. Um, I said this already in a previous video. It's probably a historic irony that, or a historic 
what did I usually say, a historic mistake or an historic uh, um, an, um, unfortunately or not the or questionable historic developments that especially in the open source world I think in, in my in my humble opinion it's an historic mistake that most people like 90% or so or even of the last decades mostly stick to see so all the, the, the Linus Torvalds, Richard uh, Stallman and Eric S. Raymond and others and the Saronic and Gnome and stuff just look on KDE and yeah maybe not the QT best toolkit for that before it was more free but all the competition of KDE versus Gnome and probably in my opinion one of the biggest mistakes of open source that too much was too, too long C and everything is crashing and all of, uh, out of bounds and stuff left and right and but of course this also triggers people that's okay leave it in the comments below um, and, and whatnot. Using Sparks we had this AMD ARM predict was tied to Keller and he left for Intel. No clue what happens now. Um, does T, T2 has so vaporous sunrise as what, T, what does T2 use? So we, as, as you've seen, I looked it up earlier, we don't even have a systemd package so I personally mostly use Sys5 in it. Uh, works for me uh, fantastically mostly for two decades anyway. We also have mean it and um, run it and certainly others. Theoretically we could add or, uh, systemd just that personally I, I don't really want to spend my time with it but um, maybe even have an open RC package not sure but I personally use this 5 in it. But you can even add this 5 uh, systemd or any other you want. Some twin clowns right way too much of the core Rust infrastructure uses unsafe in place where it shouldn't, which is a pity. Um, yeah, this is also a problem, which it's really a pity that I closed this uh, recent highlight servo history of where was this even in terms of probably somewhere here of that here. Um, what did I not want it even to say? That. Um, yeah, it also, I uh, know, I know, it's, this is unsafe. This is exactly the problem of these dependencies. When you, we had so many security vulnerabilities in dependencies, you just use something and it's either backdoored or has some security vulnerability and people, they don't review something. Uh, they don't have no time. Was it even, was it even in here? Review time. And I think it was even somewhere here. Now that I, um, I think somewhere I read uh, people have no time to um, review stuff or maybe I read it somewhere else. But long story sh short, code needs to be written more secure and yeah, if you write there that Rust stuff is using unsafe more often. This is also my issue with operating systems. So if we write an operating system, which we of course soon will continue here on this channel, then if you if you write this low-level code, then often in Rust, first of all, you need to have some assembler glue for stuff like descriptor tables or other um, management stuff for interrupts and syscall infrastructure, be it x86 or any other Spark and RISC 5 and stuff. And for this, you usually have some surrounding assembly stuff anyway. And then it doesn't take that much um, security or it doesn't add much, that much security uh, there in that regard and then as you say too many things have to uh, no people ask about go the problem is then the, I only wanted to give a quite overview and inspire thinking of monoliths versus uh, Kubernetes now we get into languages I've planned already don't forget so best share uh, and share and come back for we will I had also in military and other years so uh, first appeared in 1980s, 40 years ago, and uh, they also see that a large number of compile time checks are supported to help avoid bugs. And it's it, it security. So if people wanted to write more secure code than C and C++, ADA was there already for 40 years. And uh, do they fear while? So they have here ADA text I will put uh, case I when 
I mean, okay, well, at least you can read it for stuff in something loops. Like, yeah, you can read it, but I mean, the syntax is not the most modern, no pretty. Um, yeah, I mean, you can you can make use uh, also have uh, this guarantees um, of encoding some validation and constraints. What was here? Guards re-evaluated whether the task leaves a protected, so protected object in for mutual exclusion. Protected objects are monitor-like constructs that use guards instead of conditional variable signaling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever. Um, leave me a comment below what you think to all of this software complexity repositories, whether it be um, PHP, Perl, or Rust cargo stuff and modern languages versus all of this or more type safe and less and um, certainly as you see on this more main random news and insecurity live channel there is so much i already pick only the biggest and even then i have every two three kernel and other stuff so um there's also one so one last word this is also one thing so not only do i f find rust the most readable um, do we still have it here or did I? <clears throat> so not only do I not find Rust the most readable, I also don't like that they have their own runtime and it's somewhat incompatible with C and C++. So in my opinion, this is also one problem with many of the modern languages that they do not integrate or are not that nicely to integrate with each other. And that is certainly a huge problem also with now we have Rust, Go, Swift, Ada, C, java.net, uh, javascript and, and whatnot and uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to integrate all of the stuff and that is certainly one of the biggest issues to come and then I only see either more monoliths or more kubernetes. Um, leave in the comments below. We will have more streams including microkernel here of our own and um, uh, just because education and uh, research and in general, leave me in the comments below what you think about all this Kubernetes and monoliths and uh, different languages and runtimes and modern languages and Go and uh, Rust and um, what can be done to make this IT, the state of IT infrastructure, a better world. And I hope to see you soon for all the next videos and live streams of these topics to come.